Hey everyone, I'm Sid and I'm a fourth year medical student at King's and today I'm going to be talking to Dr. Akhilesh Pradhan who is a FY2 doctor working in Oxford and has been accepted to the core surgical trainee program. In this video we'll be going through the core surgical trainee portfolio checklist and Dr. Akhilesh will be giving us tips on how he maximized points. Dr. Akhilesh is a graduate of King's College London which is where he completed his training in medicine and has also completed a degree in anatomy, developmental and human biology for which he received first class honours. During his time at King's, Dr. Akhilesh served as the president of the KCL Surgical Society for which he organised an annual conference attended by over 100 participants. Dr. Akhilesh has a keen interest in medical education and has taught medical students at different stages of their degree. Moreover, Dr. Akhilesh is undertaking a postgraduate certificate in higher education at the University of Oxford. Dr. Akhilesh has posters, presentations, and publications in various surgical specialties, which is how he developed his research skills. Dr. Akhilesh completed his medical school elective in Johns Hopkins at the Department of Plastic Surgery before he went to the Princess Margaret Hospital in the Bahamas to spend some time at the Trauma and Orthopedics Department there. In the 2019-2020 core surgical training application cycle, Dr. Akhilesh ranked 105 out of around 980 candidates. His goal is to pursue a career in trauma and orthopedic surgery, and thus he has secured a trauma and orthopedics themed core surgical trainee job in the North Central London Deanery. In his spare time, Dr. Akhilesh is a big foodie. He loves to read and he loves to travel. So now that we know a bit more about Dr. Akhilesh, let's go have a chat with him. Hey. How's it going? I said, yeah, it's going good. Um, how are you? Yeah, all good. How have, have you been? What have you been up to? Uh, not much. Just had a day off today. So I had a nice lie in and then did, did some work. Just um, this <laughs> how are you? What about you? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Still locked in. Um, do you have work over the weekend then? Uh, no, no. So I've this was an annual leave. So I've got the weekend off and I'm back on Monday. Okay. I've got nights coming up next weekend, so yeah, not looking forward to those. <laughs> Just nights and on a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good luck with that. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to start by saying um, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, as somebody who wants to become a surgeon in the future, I think I'm going to find this so useful and I really appreciate it. And hopefully some of the people that watch this will also find it uh, useful as well. And I'm sure they will. And so, yeah, I just wanted to start by asking you, um, why did you choose surgery and how early did you uh, decide on surgery? Hmm. So, I mean, I'll start off by answering when did I pick it? So I think I really first became interested in surgery probably in first and second year. So doing sort of anatomy and dissection classes. Okay. Um, I think during work experience when you're 16, 17, you always have this idea of oh, surgery, surgeons. And quite often you'll do work experience in theatre and you'll see surgeons doing some amazing stuff, not really understanding how it sort of works. Yeah. Um, but then I think really in the dissection classes where I got to hold a scalpel, I got to sort of, you know, maneuver tissue myself and sort of look at different structures and, you know, really fascinated me how something that you learn about in a textbook can be applied in a sort of really like three, three dimensional way. So that was really where I first became interested in, in, in it. And that sort of grew through doing my BSc. So I did a BSc in anatomy um, and that really um, got me interested in sort of the surgical aspects of um, anatomy. Um, and again, during my clinical placements, um, I would often just go off and go to theatre. So, for example, my third year I was on cardiology in Ashford. And um, after I got all my sign offs for the block, I literally just um, on my days off would go into theatre, introduce myself. Um, and I got to do quite a lot of orthopedics there. So I think especially in third year, I think going into theatre and being able to assist and even like holding back some retractors and, you know, holding some instruments. Um, that was when I knew, OK, wow, this is this is definitely something which I would be interested in doing. OK. Okay, um, that's really cool. So that was the first one. Sorry, and, and you said what was the the other question was um, uh, say when did I know and then why was, why surgery why surgery um, so yeah so that's a that's a really important question so I feel in medical school at the start of medical school interviews you always get asked why medicine so I think it's a similar it's a similar thing I mean you can split it up into the sort of like 
you know, interview style answer that you want to give and then the actual style answer you want to give. So I think interview style answer I'd, I'd give would be, you know, I'm, I, I like the anatomy and the direct application of, of um, you know, anatomy in surgical practice. I enjoy the fact that you get to work with your hands and you see a direct result of the mm -hmm. things that you do. Um, and more on a personal note, I think that, you know, being able to see that instant effect of what you've done and also just sort of starting off and being excited to have a theatre list the next day. I think that is my personal motivation for doing surgery. So, I mean, I can't imagine anything better than literally waking up and thinking, oh, yeah, I've got a you know whole day of operating tomorrow. And, you know, even as even as a foundation, your doctor or even earlier um, when I would go to theatre, time would just fly. So you look at the clock, it's nine o'clock and you look at the clock again, and it's, you know, 6 p.m. And you're like, oh, wow, like this day has flown by. So. I think definitely that element of surgery is something that definitely attracts. attracts. So it sounds like you're really excited by the prospect of surgery hmm. or um, lifestyle of it as well. Yeah. Um, so I thought the way we would do this initially is um, talk through the core surgical training application. So I'll leave like a um, link to that in the description. Hmm. Um, and then at the end of that, there are a few questions that I have from um, some of my followers on Instagram, um, sure. my friends. And um, you, you said you're happy to answer those. So we'll start with the CST question. So um, right at the top of the list, it talks about additional degrees. And so you did one in anatomy, you said. Yeah, so, so like I mentioned earlier, so uh, as you know, at King's, you sort of end up intercalating between sort of second and third year. Um, so the majority of my friends intercalated and so did I. So um, the degree which I did was anatomy and developmental and human biology. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of encompasses like a whole range of different modules and things you can do. So the modules which I did were surgical anatomy, surgical sciences, um, advanced human anatomy. And I did like an experimental project, um, a lab based project, um, which was probably the biggest and like the most effort I've ever put into anything in my life. Um, mm -hmm. So my uh, my lab project was on the exonal remodeling in the brain of a fruit fly so drosophila so it was looking at sort of you had to dissect out the brain of a fruit fly and then a fire like electron mi microscope beams at it and look at the different um axonal you know remodeling at with time in the in the brain of a fruit fly as it developed and matured That's really so, precise, isn't it? yeah it was it was absolutely insane but i mean overall I, I i mean that was a really good degree to do i think it gave me a really good foundation of knowledge um, and I know a lot of people sort of went into BSc with the with the thinking of oh let me just do something where I can get an easy first or I can like just try and do something where I know that I'll get a first but I think with the anatomy degree at King's it's definitely something which is challenging it's not an easy it's not an easy course to do mm -hmm. but I definitely feel like not only did I get a first but I also did get quite a lot out of it yeah. so I, I definitely would recommend that to anyone in that position sort of between second and third year thinking of integrating. So you'd recommend integrating and the priority shouldn't just be to get a first, but also try and get something out of it, like a project. I mean, I wouldn't do, so for example, I do know that the surgery and anesthesia IBSC at Imperial is another sort of comparable um, BSc, but I have heard that it's incredibly difficult to get a first on that. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily put all my eggs in the basket of saying, oh yeah, let me just do something I'll get a lot out of. So it's, it's, important to have that balance between oh yeah okay this is an achievable first but also you know it's something which i i can get something out of okay so, i mean for me getting a first did boost up my application on cst so having a first class degree has a slightly higher marking than and weightage than getting a 2-1 okay um so the next uh, bit of the cst is the uh, CPD course. So for those of, like, those of us who don't know what a CPD course is, could you just tell us what that is? And uh, which ones have you done to get maximum points? So in terms of CPD courses, a CPD course, so CPD stands for Continuing, continuing Professional, professional Development. Um, and it, it basically contains all of the courses that the Royal College of Surgeons runs, um, as well as some extra courses which have been given CPD accreditation. Um, and basically the ones which I've done are basic surgical skills, um, start surgery, um, the uh, national catheter training course, 
um, as well as ATLS, which is Advanced Trauma Life Support. Um, I'm sorry, could you just tell us like at which point um, you did uh, that? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I was just about to say, so dip, obviously there's a whole bunch of these courses that you can do and it's really important to know when to do which one. So, um, none of the, the RCS ones, I didn't do any, I didn't do a single one in medical school. I, I did all of them as a foundation year, foundation year doctor. Um, there are stuff, there are some you can do in medical school. So I know that the BSSH, um, the, so the Hand Society, um, run uh, a, a sort of one day medical student course, which does have CT CPD points. Um, BAPRAS, um, the plastic surgery organization also has a medical student day that has CPD points on it. Um, and similarly, I, I know that some ortho um, organizations do similar things. Yeah. Um, but in terms of solely the Royal College of, Sur Royal College of Surgeons courses, um, the way in which I would structure them sort of timeline wise, which no one will tell you is, um, so I did start surgery sort of um, at the end of med school, sort of start of F1, like sort of in my first block of F1. Uh, and start surgery basically is um, a really, really informative course for any F1 sort of going through the A to E um, sort of technique. Mm -hmm. So running through a basic assessment, um, you know, airway, breathing, circulation, disability exposure, um, knowing what to do, how to escalate, when to escalate. So I think that was really good to do prior to having a surgical job. Um, however, I don't, that said, it comes with a caveat that I don't think it would be useful for an F2 or anyone above that. I think it's definitely aimed at the FY1 um, cohort. So that was one of them. The, so is that something we could do in medical school as well? Um, I think the final year. So I think maybe you could look into doing it now um, and definitely recommend it sort of doing it maybe in the first block of F1 okay. or the second block of F1. Um, similarly, basic surgical skills is something which I did in F1. So I did that towards probably the end of F1. And again, I would recommend doing that sort of end of F1, maybe F2. Um, and basically, basic surgical skills goes through a lot of the sim a lot of similar stuff that we did at King's with the surgical society. That lots of suturing and lots of lap lap skills and different kinds of suture technique, um, knowing about the instruments. So again, a really super helpful course um, to go on. And again, I think that'd be really good for anyone sort of preparing for Part A or Part B. Um, so after that, um, I did the national catheter training course. Um, and that was something which was um, done in Essex. Is the, at the moment, there's only one site that does it. Um, and unlike all the other courses, it's entirely free. So I would definitely recommend it to somebody who's, who's, who's got a bit of a tight budget, has other things to think about. So BSS and START. So BSS, I think, was 150. Um, and START was something similar. So... So they're they're fairly they're fairly pricey, um, and the national catheter training course obviously is free and and you know has a similar weightage, and is is sort of really informative in terms of knowing about catheter techniques and different kinds of catheter management, um, and finally ATLS um, so advanced trauma life support something which I did as an F two, um, it's something which you can only do as an F two and above, oh, fine. Um, so it has that caveat anyway to it, um, and again it's a I would 100% recommend anybody to do this course in F2. I think it's really, really um, important. It has really good training techniques. Again, building a bit more on the A to E assessment um, and going through sort of trauma scenarios and going through sort of C-spine and how to stabilize the C-spine um, as well as a few other things. Um, ATLS is quite expensive. So I paid, I think, about 650 for that. Yeah. Um, and the importance of doing it in F2 is sometimes um, your deanery can cover you with the study budget. So I know for my ATLS, my um, so Oxford paid for me to go on that, which was super helpful and obviously offset quite a lot for the of of the fees. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to say about the CPD courses overall is that in the 2020 portfolio checklist, that's actually changed now. So yeah. CPD courses don't have a separate section. So they actually fall under the commitment to surgery section now. Okay. Um, unfortunately, um, during sort of my year, they changed the um, checklist um, about two weeks before the interviews. Uh -huh. So um, the whole like sort of we had four or five points for CPD courses and they basically counted for almost nothing and were sort of put in the commitment to surgery section. 
Okay. Um, but I definitely 100% would recommend doing all of the courses which I've mentioned because I think they put you at a really good um, stead um, to sort of go about sort of further exams and surgical training in general. Okay, fine. Um, so we just need to keep an eye out on whether the CPD course counts for points or not, but regardless, it's something that's useful. Yeah, and it, and, it, and it definitely is a part of the commitment to surgery section. So um, I think they get, you can get up to, I think, four or four of six points for it. So it's still worth quite a bit. Okay. Um, and then next on the core surgical training checklist is additional achievements. So what counts as these and uh, what was yours, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, sure. So um, additional achievements is awards and um, things which you've achieved um, in medical school um, that show sort of uh, differentiation between you and your peers. Um, so the one which I used for getting maximum points for me was um, getting multiple merits during medical school and getting a distinction. So I got a distinction in my clinical years and I had merits throughout sort of medical school in different in different years. So um, that was that got me, I think, four out of five points. Um, what normally gets you five out of five points is having a um, national prize. So getting an essay competition and getting a prize for that. Um, other things which I had put in there were also um, I got a prize during my BSc year. So um, I, I got um, the highest mark in my advanced human anatomy module. So I put that in um, as well as um, also just to pad up my portfolio. I also put in my gold crown, my four shields, my sort of King's volunteering awards, my right. King's um, leadership and professional skill, skills award, and also some of the bursaries which I'd got. So BAPRAS, and King's had given me, both had separately given me bursaries of, I think, um, 500 pounds. And I think the uni gave me a bursary of about $3,000 to go to Hopkins. Um, so I put that in the additional achievement section as well. That's so basically looking at the prizes that you've got. Okay. That's, that's really impressive, um, all the prizes you've won. Um, so the simplest way of doing that is just getting a national prize then. Yeah, I mean, the simplest way would be, I mean, if I were to go about it again, I maybe my third year would have um, thought about submitting a, um, a submitting a uh, essay to the RSM. So I know the RSM runs um, a few essay competitions, so I probably would have um, applied for one of those. Um, or again, similarly, there are, I mean, I know some unis um, run sort of national competitions. So for example, my flatmate um, got five out of five points for that for um, a neurosurgical um, poster competition he'd won. So, so if, you win a, um, if you win a prize for a poster nationally, that counts as well. Okay, fine. Um, so next up is uh, teaching experience. And this is something I'm quite interested in. Um, I skipped over QIP. We'll come back to that in a second. But um, just wanted to go over teaching experience. Uh, what teaching experience did you carry out? So again, um, with any with any section of of the checklist, I would say that you need to know what scores the maximum points. Okay. And I'm not saying you have to play it as a game, but in a way, you have to look at it as a way of how can I maximize my marks, and you need to know what you need to do to maximize your marks. So. Throughout medical school, I'd done a lot of peer teaching. I'd done a lot of sort of, you know, peer assisted learning. Um, I'd given a lot of independent lectures and things like that um, for, for the MSA and things like, uh, and other sort of organizations. Um, I'd done some um, teaching with the Royal College of Surgeons. So um, I was actually one of the medical student volunteers who would go into schools um, during sort of my third, third and fourth year. And, and I would teach suturing to sixth formers and things like that. But what got me sort of the highest marks was basically um, designing and organizing a teaching program um, and uh, designing a journal club during my FY one year. So during my um, stroke and cardiology rotation, um, me and one other um, sort of F1, who was also surgically inclined, um, we organized a journal club. Okay. And doing that is achieves the highest marks. And the way in which you sort of evidence that is getting sort of a senior consultant or someone, a, a consultant in the department to write you a letter. So that, that's super, super helpful. And it, you, uh, so for in terms of what I did for that, I actually um, wrote a draft letter for my consultant and I worded it in a very similar way to, to, to the points. Um, and I basically said, oh, have a look at this letter. Feel free to amend it as you wish. And if you can sign it, that would be brilliant. So 
um, and that, so that's what happened and he sent it back to me quite kindly and, and I could put that in. But um, basically designing and leading um, a teaching program, which means um, like I think two or more sessions is, is, is what ticks those boxes for that. Um, and is there a, so it's two or more sessions then? Yeah. Fine. I thought there was like a time uh, component to it. Okay. Yeah, there is. So it's two or more sessions over a period of at least six months. Six months. Okay. So with the journal club, we used to do it every week and it's been running for the, I think it's still running now. So it's been running for a good year, two years now. Yeah. That's um, cool. journal club. And I'd also organize teaching for Oxford medical students with a couple of the other F1s. And again, that ran over, I think, eight months whilst I was an F1. So um, it's, it's very doable. And it's something which you could potentially do as a medical student. So you have to, so you can avoid sort of doing it as a foundation, your doctor. But again, this is one of those things that you end up repeating yourself and it shows consistency. So if you did do it as a medical student and you did it as an F1, you can use both of those and say, look, I've clearly got the points for this. Okay. And you can argue your case at, at, at the station. Fine. Um, and just going back to the uh, quality improvement project, uh, what was your quality improvement project and um, how do you set one up and where would you recommend presenting it? Mm. So similar to, to sort of with the teaching, um, it's really, really important to look at the wording of the checklist. So maximum, maximum points is to do a closed loop audit. So to, to you know, start, start an audit, make a change, make an intervention and then to re-audit it. Um, I actually hadn't done a closed loop audit as a medical student, um, but I had done a closed loop QI project. So um, I think one of the sort of one of my prouder achievements in research whilst I was a medical student was um, basically working on um, a pediatric um, surgical project on buried bumper syndrome, which is to do with gastrostomy feeding in, in children. Um, and basically, if you don't look after the gastrostomy properly, um, you can get a complication called buried bumper where the gastric mucosa blocks the tube and it requires surgical intervention to change. So I sort of did a QI project looking at the incidence of that at Evelina Children's Hospital. Um, I looked at, um, you know, large sort of 10 year retrospective review of, of children. We implemented a change, which was to have a clinical nurse specialist in the department who'd be able to um, give specialist instructions to parents on how to maintain um, the gastrostomy. And then I closed it by then re-auditing it at one year and two years. Um, and I was able to present that on um, at a national meeting in Leeds. Um, so that was so that was definitely um, a project which got the maximum points, mm -hmm. but it wasn't necessarily an audit. It was a quality improvement project. So, you do either. so then when I was um, also when I was at F1, I then did an audit. So um, quite cheekily, I did quite a basic, simple audit. So um, it was actually on my first job. So I did urology um, in Wickham Hospital as my first job in F1. And I did a very box standard, simple VT audit. So I did a VT audit on documentation of um, whether patients are receiving deltaparin, so whether they were receiving you know, thromboprophylaxis and whether they were receiving their TED stockings prior and after surgery. So I looked at a two week period um, and I said, oh, great, compliance is about 90, 95 percent for, 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 for those things. How can we improve it? So then I um, led an intervention where I made some posters. Um, I stuck them up on the ward. I spoke to the nurses to say, oh, can you please nudge the junior doctors and the night team to, you know, complete the VT assessments and, and make sure the documentation is completed. Um, and then I basically got the next cohort of F1s who's doing that job. So when I was in my last placement, I got them to, who, the ones who are on urology, to then re-audit it. Um, and so when you re-audit it, you don't have to lead it. You don't have to be the sort of main person doing all the data collection. Um, you can get them to do it. And then you have your name at the end. And that is you closing the loop. Okay. So that means that you've led and designed the audit. Whereas they've just led that one component of the audit. Okay. Um, so again, that ticked the audit box for me as, as getting full points. But, but of course, I mean, like besides this, I would also recommend doing other audits. So whilst I was a medical student, I was involved in, you know, data collection for a plastic surgery audit on K-wires. 
Um, I was involved in a ped surgical audit on sort of surgical referrals and um, even on stroke, I did like a catheter documentation audit, which was a very simple audit then as well. So um, especially when it comes to sort of uh, even higher training, so reg level training, they, they, look at, they look at the number of audits you've done. So it's really important that you haven't just got like one or two good ones, but you've also got quite a few um, collaborative ones and you've got a few ones that you've just done on the ward with other people. Fine. So they want you to keep auditing as you progress through. Absolutely. And, um, and so for the basic requirement for F1 and F2 <clears throat> prior to COVID was that you needed at least one audit per year. Okay. So the VT audit was my um, audit for my F1 year, similar with the, the um, catheter audit. And this year I did another VT audit in trauma. So um, you can obviously do the same. You can do this, a similar topic. Um, but obviously the departments were completely different. So again, it was a separate audit to that. That's fine. Um, so now going back to teaching, um, have you done any training in teaching? And what does that like encompass? Hmm. So training in teaching is a difficult one as a medical student. There's not really much you can do. Um, so whilst I was working at State Mandeville last year, there was a, there was a reg there who basically um, told me that Imperial, they do like a five day course. Yeah. in in training and teaching whilst you know as a medical student and that counts for for this section um however you know being at king's we we, we we don't really get exposed to training and teaching we don't get um told to go on any of these courses so um when that section came up i actually took it on myself to you know go and see whether i could go on any courses um so one good really really good resource which i used to get these points was the royal college of physicians so the royal college of physicians um has a whole set of workshops and teaching days um and the two which i went on were effective teaching skills which was a two-day course okay. um and on the job teaching which was a one-day course right. these courses are aimed at senior trainees so they're aimed at reg level um trainees so i was one of the more junior people there um, I did feel a little bit out of place, but again, it's all really useful for this section um, and it gives you the points that you need for it. And, I, and you need at least a three days worth of um, teaching to qualify for, I think, four out of four, five points for it. Yeah. Um, that said, I then ended up doing a PG cert and getting onto a PG cert um, degree at, at Oxford. So, um, again, that was the same amount of points as going on a three day course. So, so, so I mean, the weightage is a bit sort of weird in that sense because doing three days um of you know these royal college physician courses is equal to you know being um uh on the on the member you know or doing on the sort of faculty of the um pg cert degree so um it's yeah it really depends on what you want to do and how you want to use your time um be aware that the royal college of physician courses are quite expensive so um again i must have spent probably maybe 500 um pounds on both courses combined um and i know that the teaching the teachers course is something similar probably 600 pounds for that one and how much is the pg cert if you don't mind me asking so the pg cert so um unfortunately the one which i'm doing is is a sort of very um uh, how can I put it? It's sort of very exclusive PG cert for people only at Oxford. So the one which I did was is free at the moment. Okay. Um, and it was it was basically through emailing them and basically giving them a list of everything I'd done, um, and it was done on academic merit. But okay. there are there are um, there are PG certs which I would definitely recommend doing. I know Dundee, I think University of Dundee runs one, okay. um, which is a sort of remote PG cert on um, sort of medical education. Um, and I think that would probably be a less, probably be a lot less work than the PGs that I'm doing at the moment. But um, I was just very fortunate to be on this one. I, I, and I don't think it's really open to sort of general public. Okay. Um, next up is presenting at conferences. And um, just wanted to ask, what did you present and where? I think you said something about presenting in Milan. Mm, so... So I was very fortunate in um, in the fact that the uh, project which I did on buried bumpers as a third year medical student, actually we were able to write up as a paper and write up as a presentation. Um, and um, I presented that at UPSA, which is basically the European um, Association of Pediatric Surgeons um, in Milan. So I was able to give an international oral presentation, um, which basically ticks all the points and, and you get all the points for that. Um, 
and sort of so that was sort of my big showy one but I've done a, a few more presentations so um, I gave a regional presentation um, on the sort of re-audit of that um, quality improvement project um, and I've also sort of um, presented the presented that at Leeds um, uh, in, in a sort of similar circumstance and similarly with the um, VTE audit which I did in FY one year I was able to present that nationally at the um, sort of Oxfordshire uh, QI conference as well so certainly even as an F1 there are ways in which you can um, present things so uh, it's not just that as a medical student you get these opportunities you certainly get plenty of opportunities to um, put your uh, projects forward in QI conferences and things like that. Um, as a medical student, I put you know as a as an addition to this projects for assets and things for this, things like that. But again, it's important to note that they don't get the maximum marks. They get a few marks, and it's good to have them because obviously um, you know everything looks looks good on on a portfolio. But it's important to note that the maximum marks are for the um, regional and national oral presentations. Okay. And sorry, sorry, international presentations. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so, an international oral presentation or a national oral presentation is full points. Yeah. Okay. And that links in nicely to the next question, which is about publications and um, how can medical students get published, in your opinion? So yeah, um, there's a variety of ways, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of it is luck, and a lot of it is sort of being in the right place at the right time. Okay. And although I say that element is luck, being in the right place at the right time can be up to you. And it's really sort of how how much you're able to invest your time in in sort of meeting people and networking that really plays a part in this. Okay. So um, the way in which I got into research and the way in which I got this project that, you know, got published, got me to Milan um, was through um, being involved in pediatric society so in my second year of med school I was um, on the committee of PEDSOC so I was um, academic events rep or something like that and um, I was running a crash course for fourth year medical students um, and one of the speakers was a um, PEDS trainee and, and she was like oh I've got a couple of projects if anyone's interested come find me afterwards um, and you know I can try and see if I can get you involved so, so yeah, literally, I just went over after the conference and said, oh, I'm on the committee, really keen to get involved in research. Is there anything that you'd suggest? Is there anything I could do? And she put me in touch with um, one of the consultants over at Evelina, who was this really, really lovely chap, Mr. Pardier, who basically took me under his wing. Um, at that point, I literally knew nothing about research. Um, he got me collecting some data, uh, and then he sort of went through the analysis with me and with the team. Uh, and then it sort of really kicked off from there. So, so that was um, that paper. And then in addition, um, sort of in my final year, I did another paper with him. So I just, I just kept a good connection with him, um, really friendly terms with him. And I sort of told him, uh, is there anything else I can get involved with? I'm really keen. And then he gave me another project to do, which again got published as well. So the, the important thing is, I, I would say, is to try and find a mentor in medical school. Try and find um, a, a consultant who, especially, which I think is especially doable in London, because mm -hmm. so many are involved in research, so many are involved in teaching, is to find a consultant who's really keen, um, likes to likes medical students, likes medical students to be involved in stuff, um, and then work on that relationship and and give give that consultant the output that they need and put in that effort initially. Yeah. Um, and then they, you know, respect you and they, and they, and they, you know, they, uh, they're aware that they can rely on you and then they give you more stuff to do. Right. And, and that's how things really go places. Um, one of my, one of my um, papers again was uh, through surgical society. So um, a colleague basically posted on there whether they could, someone could do some data collection for a project. Um, I was more than keen to do that. And then again, that turned into a publication. Um, so th that's that's I would say the main way as a medical student. So it would be finding a, a consultant or a reg to to latch onto and to um, try and do work from. Um, but as a as a F one or an F two, um, you can basically try and set your own project up. 
So um, in my F1 year, I did a um, systematic review on um, shoulder dislocations with um, basically uh, a colleague of mine who I, you know, sort of bumped into, wasn't really, we weren't really working together, but I was sort of like, oh, hey, I need help with the cannula. Do you mind? Came over, we got started getting talking. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm interested in ortho. I was like, oh, I'm interested in ortho too. Uh, and I was like, oh, we've got some time. Do you want to fancy doing a paper together? And then that's how it sort of kicked off. Um, and now that one is getting published in the um, Chinese Journal of Trauma in uh, in a, I think probably this month or next month. So so yeah, it's it's yeah, definitely it's cool. to, to get papers out there. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, I think I have three papers, um, and I think that's probably an okay amount to have. Um, and I've got probably I've got one in sort of the review process about to get published. And I'm currently writing one up at the moment as well. So, so I mean, hopefully by the time I enter reg training, I should have about five. Um, but that said, again, it's completely variable. Everyone's experience is completely, completely variable. I know some of my friends who have one or two publications um, at this stage or may even have one or two at the reg level. Um, but then I also I have colleagues in Oxford who have sort of three or four pages on um, Google Scholar of, of, of just their names and them being involved in different projects. So it's a spectrum and it really depends on where you want to lie on it. Um, for me, I wanted projects which I was personally interested in and which could get published. Um, and I think for sort of publication to get the maximum points, I think it was you need two first author publications to get the maximum points. Okay. Um, so me for example at the moment I only have one so my paper which I did in final year I was the first author on and the two other ones I was I think second and third author on um so it completely varies and it completely depends on on, on uh, what how you get involved and what you're interested in um similarly the the systematic review I've done again I'm I think I'm fourth or fifth author on that um and uh, the paper writing up right now I'm first author on that so massive spectrum of how involved you can be okay. it's 19 hours sorry about that that's my uh, computer no, that's fine. Um, next up uh it's about leadership and management roles which ones have you done and what counts as a national leadership uh role hmm. so i i mean starting at sort of the most basic level so i i mean thinking sort of first year second year third year med school um it's always really important to be on on committees so especially to any of the younger listeners um in in this and by, by that i mean the first or second years um i would definitely recommend that you join a society you get on the council and you work your way up especially if you do have a surgical interest so i mean the first things i did was things which I really, I currently am not interested in. So I was the treasurer of palliative care society. I was academic events officer for um, PEED society. Um, and I sort of was on a whole bunch of, I was on gastro, I was the VP of gastro society. Right. Um, and then finally, I think it was in third year that I got onto the committee of surgical society. So I started off as events and then I was clinical and then um, I was president. So um, sort of building my way up through the years. Yeah. So unfortunately, even though I was president of surgical society, that only got me four out of eight marks. Yeah. So hard, like hardly any, if you actually think about it, for the amount of effort that I ended up putting into it. So it's, again, similar to the other, it's a similar theme to what I've said before. It really depends on looking at the mark scheme and being a little bit clever about what you end up doing. Um, so that got me four points. But I, the, the thing that got me the four marks... Um, was something which I actually did in um, in end of F1, sort of midway, halfway through F1. So I'm on the um, plastic surgery chapter. So I'm on the council for plastic surgery of the Royal Society of Medicine. Okay. So that obviously is a, is a national committee. So um, being on the council of that um, gave me the four the four points for for that section. So again, similarly to um, the other sections. If I was a fourth year, final year medical student, I'd be really looking at sort of looking to get on committees such as BOTA or ASSIT and being being a student representative on those. Um, or, you know, even BAT Press as a, as a student council, um, getting on that. Um, anything you can to get onto the national platform is good. I know, I know especially there's a women in surgery um, chapter of the Royal College of Surgeons as well. So one of my really good friends is on that. 
and um, my flatmate is on the sort of junior doctor committee of the Royal College of Surgeons as well. So there's definitely definitely ways in which you can get to the national platform for for societies. Okay. Um, and again, like you said, it's just about reading the CST and just understanding the wording of things so that you can be smart about how you decide yeah. what to do. Yeah, and, and be smart about it, but but don't do something which you you're, you have no interest in. Uh, interest in. I would definitely hammer home the point that always be keen to do what you want to do. Otherwise, it just shows. Um, in in addition to actually being on the committee, you do have to show a positive effect on the society for at least six months. So on the Plastic Surgery Council, I was able to help organise UPRAS, which is one of the um, undergraduate days that the RSM runs. Um, and, and obviously as president of the surgical society around the conference and, and various events throughout the year. So it's really important that you do something which you have a definite interest in. Okay. Um, so the next question, I think you've covered it uh, quite well, which is how do you display commitment to surgery? But um, So I, that's just a mix of doing all of these things and sort of putting that together in a portfolio, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, commitment to surgery is a very, very big section. And um, funnily enough, um, the sort of station when you actually have the interview they they expect you to have things in that section that you don't have anywhere else so you can't have your the same audit or you can't have um, the same sort of project that you've done uh, in that project section or publication section and then have it in your commitment to surgery section so in addition to all the things which I mentioned before you can you can further show commitment to surgery and the way in which you can do that is by doing an, another separate audit or project. So again, I mentioned my infection in KY is project. So that one, um, I've done some collaborative surgical projects um, with uh, sort of Star Surge. Um, so I was on the recon and the X trial, which I which I've helped out with. Um, having membership of a surgical society um, is very useful in this section as well. So um, having an affiliate membership of the Royal College of Surgeons, which only is I think about ten or fifteen pounds, um, that counts. Being a, a member of ASSET also counts. And again, I think that's about 60 or 70 pounds. Um, and again, RSM as well. So I'm a member of the um, Royal Society of Medicine. So would that give you three separate points or is that one point for? Uh, I, th I think one point for, for, for membership okay. or potentially maybe two if, if, they're, being, if they're being lenient and kind. Um, other things which are included in this um, section and especially are, are things which you can do in med school are a surgical elective. Okay. So um, going on a surgical elective and having evidence of um, sort of an acceptance letter or evidence of, you know, letters of thanks or letters of appreciation whilst you've been there mm -hmm. or giving sort of presentations whilst you're on, on the elective. Again, that's really strong evidence of, of having a surgical elective. So, um, so for my elective, I sort of spent a month in uh, Johns Hopkins doing plastic surgery. Um, and I spent one month in Bahamas doing uh, trauma and orthopedics. Right. So um, for Hopkins, I had a whole bunch of acceptance, le acceptance letters. I had my bursary letter um, and I had a little clinical performance assessment at the end of the rotation by um, my lead attending, um, which all counted as evidence. And similarly for my Bahamas rotation, I'd, I'd, I'd given a presentation on ankle fractures, which I put in there. And I also gave a presentation to Batpras when I came back sort of in my F1 year um, on the undergraduate day, I gave a elective talk um, on, on that as well. Right. So obviously surgical elective. Other things, um, doing MRCS part A. So right. that counts in the section. Um, so you don't have to have passed it for it to be included as a point. So even if you have sat it, you can still include it um, in the section and it shows a commitment to surgery. Okay. Um, and I'm sure we'll end up speaking about the part A in, in, a, in a short while. Um, other things which, again, are included in that section are also um, surgical experience evidenced by an operative logbook. Okay. And um, for that, you can basically um, make an account on e-logbook mm -hmm. and start logging some of the procedures which you've done. Okay. So interestingly enough, as a medical student, I didn't have e-logbook and... Um, how I made a note of it was basically like a word document with a whole bunch of sort of dates and, and procedures and what I did. Um, so I included that in, in, in the um, portfolio and they looked at that and that counted as well. Yeah. It's important to get it signed off and verified. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and what I mean by that is um, if you have a educational supervisor for the year I would go to them I'd show them that you'd done you know you assisted in these many operations uh, and whether they could just verify it just to say that you've spoken through it with them yeah. um, and similarly for F1 F2 I did get e-log book so I started logging stuff on there and I would highly recommend that you guys do start using e-log book from whichever stage you're at okay because that is a that is the super impressive and important thing which they look at at interview if you don't have an e-log book it can sometimes be looked down upon as in a, why does this person not have an e-log book so regardless of how many procedures you log on it whether it's 5 10 15 20 i would still recommend that you do it right. um and again i was able to get that verified by my educational supervisor for my f2 year and again take that to interview fine um, do you get to see many um, operations or do anything in F1? Um, so F1 year can be hit and miss. It really depends on where you have your job. It really depends on the department and, and the setup of the unit. So, for example, I know one of my really good friends, Dev, um, who's working in, who worked in capturing in, in his first year. He had a really good experience. Um, he basically was able to try and do a couple of carpal tunnel releases himself under supervision, which was which was amazing. Um, in contrast, I mean, my experience was slightly different. I, I had to really fight my way into theatre and really fight for um, getting some time in, in, in the operating theatre solely because the clinical and the ward duties were so many. Okay. Um, however, that said, I did still manage to get into theatre. So during my F1 year, I had um, urology and emergency general surgery as my as my um, surgical jobs. So in urology, there were there were only two junior doctors for um, the whole ward. So we normally would have twenty four patients, mm -hmm. and um, at any any one time, there would either only be one of us, or if we're lucky, two of us. Um, so it was quite a lot of heavy sort of workload in the ward side of things. So getting away to theatre was extremely rare. And even then, I'm, I must have got on, gotten away about maybe seven or eight times. Um, and again, building a really good trust with your consultant and your um, senior registrars is very key to this. So during that rotation, I got to drain a few abscesses. So I got to drain some scrotal abscesses. I got to drain an abscess on the ward. Um, I got to do. I got to hold a camera during one of the um, turp procedures and things like that. So urology is slightly different in the sense that a lot of the procedures are sort of single player. A lot of the turp and the TURBT procedures are very much a sort of consultant or senior um, reg led procedure. It's very difficult to. There's no holding retractors or anything like that in those procedures, so it's quite difficult to get stuck in on those. But certainly the open procedures, so open prostatectomies, um, was something that I was able to get get involved with, um, and especially the abscesses as well. Um, that said, um, in my general surgery block, I got to drain quite a few abscesses um, to the point where I was able to drain um, sort of perianal abscesses, uh, supervised, trainer, and scrubbed. So I'd have my um, senior reg just basically watching, making sure that I was doing 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 a good job. He'd let me write the um, post-operative note. Uh, he'd let me write, um, you know, in that as well with his supervision. Um, so that gave me a really good experience of start to finish. So prepping the patient, draping the patient, um, you know, getting all your surgical instruments, having your um, surgical nurse, nursing assistant pass you the instruments uh, and knowing what to do, knowing how to make the incision, knowing how to pack it and knowing the post-operative instructions um, on, on the post-operative list again was something which, uh, which, which was a really, really good experience for me to have. Um, and then further to top it off in my um, FY2 year, um, probably my most memorable experience so far was um, again, Similarly, my F2 job in trauma was completely, completely ward-based. It was so difficult to get to theatre um, to the point where a consultant said they'd never seen an F2 in theatre before, before I before I had sort of gone there. Oh, wow. um, so I think that was probably one of the reasons the consultant may have given me more, more responsibility because he probably thought it was, <laughs> it was a bit more senior. But basically, I was able to do a dynamic hip screw um, from start to finish, um, supervised, trainer, trainer scrubbed. Wow. So that was the first time, you know, I literally got to do things from the from knife incision to closure of the wound. 
um, and it was it was amazing. It was it was a really really good eye opening procedure for me to do, and it really um, reassured me that surgery was for me. Um, I think the biggest thing is knowing whether surgery is for you is is getting to theatre and knowing whether you can do stuff or not. Right. And doing that DHS was definitely um, at least a partial confidence boost. Yeah. Um, I know I'm spending a lot of time talking about surgical experience in theatre. Obviously, surgery does encompass like uh, clinics and ward duties. Um, ward duties, you obviously will get used to just on the job, by the by, doing any surgical job. So being on take for, for your surgical firm, again, is something which will get you um, accustomed to the kind of common things that come through the door. Um, and again, clinics is, is I think, a very enjoyable experience if, if, if you know what you're doing and if you've got the adequate support. So okay. that was something which I attended a couple of times during my trauma job as well. Fine. Um, so going back to the uh, CST, uh, so that's pretty much how you would have gotten extra points for the uh, clinical and procedural experience, right? Um, yeah. So, so again, those two sections could sort of tie in together. Mm -hmm. I, I would say the clinical procedural one was slightly different and again it was done in a way which you have to really look at the wording okay. and to get the marks of that section I um, used obviously that logbook which I created mm -hmm. but also letters from, 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 the, from my consultants and from my educational supervisors um, who were sort of overseeing my performance whilst I was on the placement. So as a, as a junior, if you're keen on surgery, I would try and get as many surgical placements as I can. So if you're, if you're a fourth year or you're a final year looking for where to go for foundation year, um, one of the big factors for me was how many surgical rotations I would have in the two years. So definitely having that helped me get those letters. So I had a letter from um, Mr. Griffin, who's a really, really big, um, pelvic and trauma surgeon at um, JR at the moment who I understand is, is moving over to Barts now where I'll also be working um, from October um, so he was my clinical supervisor and I sort of told him about all my experiences I told him about doing the DHS he'd seen me work on the ward so he was more than happy to write me quite a quite a sweet letter of sort of um, acknowledgement and confirming my experience um, and similarly whilst I was on general surgery as an F1 I had um, Tanya Magro, one of the um, consultants, um, general emergency general surgeons, write me again a really lovely letter saying, um, you know, all the all this experience that I'd gained and, and things like that. Okay, fine. Um, so I think that concludes it for the CST application. Uh, I just want to ask you how your core surgical trainee interview actually was. Mm. Um, what's that actually like? Yeah. So I mean, it was. <laughs> I feel you definitely have to prepare for it and I would say it's a very much doable if you've been doing all of the things which we've spoken about sort of throughout sort of from med school to sort of foundation year. Mm -hmm. um, so the interview split up into three stations. Okay. So you have a, um, the first station you start off with is your um, management scenario station uh, and then you go into your portfolio station and then you have your clinical scenario. Each station is about 10 minutes long um, and so, sort of starting off with the management station um, you go in um, you have to basically prepare a speech okay so before the interview about a month in advance you get told that you're going to be given a speech to prepare um, normally this is around a general topic so the topic for our year was leadership so it's a general general sp speech that you have to prepare around leadership for about three minutes and you have to learn it off by heart. So you can't have like a sheet of paper in front of you. Obviously that would look terrible. I mean, I'm sure people did, but um, the recommendation for my seniors was to make sure that I'd learned it off by heart. Okay. So you have that for three minutes um, and then you get asked questions on the, on the, on the speech that you've given for two minutes. Okay. Um, and then after that, you get given a clinical scenario. So the clinical scenario can be any sort of ethical scenario that you face. Okay. Um, again, there's lots of sort of um, core surgical training interview courses, which um, people sort of go on and sign up to, and they have some really good sort of practice scenarios to do. Okay. Um, 
I would say that if if there is anybody on here who'd who'd want some sort of core surgical training interview sort of scenarios or sort of help with any of that, I I am more than happy to be approached. Um, I'm on um, Instagram and I'm sure Sid has my contact details as well, who where, where you can pass out. But the um, management scenarios basically can um, run from anything from a difficult colleague, so you might have a senior who's who's you know um, being difficult and shouts at one of the juniors. How how would you handle that? Um, to having a drunk um, consultant on the ward, um, to having sort of other things such as the such as you know potentially a colleague who's consistently late for work. How would you manage that? Fine. The important thing with this is to have a um, have a structure. I think anything in medicine is always is very structure driven, um, and there's different structures which you can use to to sort of um, phrase your 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 answer. Um, and I think that was something which did work quite well for me in the end Fine. so that was that's management yeah. and then the portfolio section we've obviously spoken about in great detail so basically you go in um they have your portfolio in front of them which you've handed in at the start of the day and they basically go through the checklist with you um they've already gone through the checklist before we come in so they uh, the examiners often have um one to two minutes where they've already marked you um, and basically they only go through the points where they think they, they need to give you more marks or potentially uh, they're not quite sure whether they should give you those marks. Right. Um, and then they go through it. So, I mean, I went in the portfolio station with the, with the idea that, oh yeah, I've, I've written everything out on my checklist. Everything's quite clear. I don't think I'd have much of a case to fight. Um, but I went in there and I really did have to fight for some of some of the points which I'd mentioned. They really did grill me on each and everything which I'd done. And they really wanted to know in great detail how I'd managed to do it. Okay. Um, and then finally, <laughs> the clinical um, station. So the clinical station is something which um, is split up again into two clinical scenarios. One is normally a sort of A to E assessment in, in ED. Okay. And the second one is a sort of ward-based scenario where you have a um, acutely deteriorating patient. Um, so the clinical scenario for sort of the um, a &E, um setting, normally you go in and you basically present it in a very structured form in an A to E approach. So okay. definitely having done ATLS before the interview is quite quite um, useful. Cool. And it gave me that sort of edge to, to sort of structure my answer in a very A to LS, A, A to E ATLS um, approach. Okay. Um, I'd also recommend reading um, the CRISP protocol. So the CRISP course is something which um, I'll probably end up doing as a core surgical training. It's, it's sort of the next level um, sort of along from ATLS. Um, it sort of gives a slightly different approach to dealing with acutely unwell patients on the ward. Um, so reading that protocol also I found very helpful in answering those questions. Um, the, the questions range completely. So the A&E the scenario can be anything from sort of acute pancreatitis to sort of splenic infarct after trauma um, to sort of um, a broken fracture, broken bone, sorry, uh, resulting in fracture. Um, and then the ward-based scenario can be, um, for example, a hypoxic patient or um, a patient who's agitated or a patient with a fever right. and knowing what to do for them. So remembering the really important constructs of sort of sepsis six mm -hmm. and again, knowing A to, A to E assessment and sort of being able to talk through that in a very structured form. Um, I think in the clinical scenario and in the interview in general, if you have a good structure to your answers, you can't go that wrong with it. You, as long as you have a structure and you stick to the structure, you should be able to get the majority of the marks. Okay, fine. Um, all right, so that's all for CST. Uh, Akash, I think I'm going to split this up into two videos. So I think I'll close up on the CST at this point. Uh, I just want to cool. say thanks uh, so much for going through this with me. No I think problem. it's been really useful. I think I've gained a better, better insight into core surgical training. Um, and on... Just for this video, um, yeah, that will be it for this. Um, yeah, thank you. No problem. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it useful. And if you would like to get in touch with Dr. Akhilesh, you can message him on Instagram at Akhilesh Pradhan. And if you'd like to get in contact with me, you can message me on Instagram as well, at The Worldwide Medic. And I'm always happy to have a chat. If you enjoyed this video, please do subscribe and leave any comments below that you have. So until then, thanks, bye.